This is the Jedberg Podcast. I'm the host, Fran Ricciopi. Each episode, I speak with transformative leaders, visionaries, drivers of change, and those dedicated to winning, no matter the challenge. The Jedberg Podcast is founded in the lineage of the special operations Jedberg teams of the past and is sponsored by Talent War Group, an executive search and talent advisory. Visit talentwargroup.com for more. A percentage of all proceeds is dedicated to the Special Operations Warrior Foundation. This episode is brought to you by Analytics. As owners of small to medium-sized businesses, we face tons of challenges in our companies. Imagine if our only role as owners was to focus on growing our business, not on all the other stuff that needs to get done. Analytics specializes in helping businesses succeed by doing just that, managing everything else. Analytics provides a deep bench of solutions to handle the most complex challenges in finance and accounting, IT, data management, AV, and healthcare. Around these services, they wrap Insight 360, a cloud-based portal that houses your company's financial and operational information. Insight 360 develops customized reports showing key metrics, benchmarks, and KPIs for better insight into your business's performance. Visit analytics.com for more information. That's A N A L Y. TIX.com. Driving change begins with the need to build something you believe in. Seth Goldman delivers products based on integrity, honesty, and healthy living. He's the founder and chief change agent at Eat the Change. He's the chairman of the board at Beyond Meat, and he is the founder and former TEO of Honest Tea. Seth joins me in this episode to explain that becoming a chief change agent starts with a vision for a cleaner way of life. We tie entrepreneurism and building something from nothing into the nine characteristics of elite performance, showing that a combination of all of them are required to build, scale, and exit a successful business. Seth also shares his three Ps of entrepreneurship, how the Boston Red Sox taught him important lessons on resiliency and adaptability, the selection process for choosing the right business partner, and how entrepreneurs cannot delegate anything in the very beginning. Seth first introduced the world to organic, fair trade iced tea. Now he's showing us that plant-based burgers and mushroom jerky will change our lives and our snacking habits for good, especially the habanero barbecue. Seth, welcome to the Jedberg Podcast. Thanks, Fran. Great to be with you. You have impacted so many industries, organizations, people, society. You've driven global awareness to fair trade, honest products, healthy living. You've developed organizations that take care of their people. You've been the subject of business school case studies and the good ones too, not the ones (laughs) about what not to do. There's so many topics that we could discuss here, so many lessons to learn about entrepreneurship, leadership, innovation. We only have a couple of hours, we, but we could write a book on any one of the topics that we're going to cover here. You did write a book on it, a New York Times bestseller, Mission in a Bottle. I read it. It was absolutely fantastic. I learned Thank so you. much. And I, before we started, I was telling you some stories about things that I'm experiencing every day that I'm immediately tying into that book saying, oh, I'm not the only one who's lived this. But I want to tell your story through the lens of the nine characteristics of elite performance as defined by special operations forces. We talk about it in every episode, but in a couple of these episodes, the story of the guest is best told if we break each one of these down on their own. The lessons from your journey are captured in the display of these characteristics, drive, resiliency, adaptability, humility, integrity, effective intelligence, team ability, curiosity, and emotional strength. But I want to start with the core tenet of the Jedberg podcast. We've based this show on the premise that we have conversations with visionaries, drivers of change, transformative leaders. I've been so fortunate to have a lot of different conversations with guests who are driving organizations, societies, and industries forward. But a vision for a better world requires a strict adherence to a mission to achieve that vision. Without it, you don't get there. It's what we call on the podcast, winning no matter the challenge. And so we've spoken to CEOs, chief marketing officers, founders, Olympians, professional athletes, doctors, spy masters, a chief soul officer. You are the first chief change agent. And before you were the first chief change agent, you were a TEO. Mission in a Bottle states a few things about you. Quote, it wasn't a question of if Seth would start a business but when and what kind. He needed to find something that had a social mission, unquote. 
In referencing Rainforest Crunch, you said, what an amazing concept that a business could make change happen and fund its growth through profits. Your self-defined interest is in business as an agent of change. You even referenced Martin Luther King in your teachings in China and said that I have a dream speech was about hopes for a better world. Can you define change, the change that you seek, your hopes for a better world, and what does that end state look like? Sure, sure. Well, first of all, it's really thinking, you know, obviously change is about moving from where we are to where we could be. And so it's an aspirational vision. And a little bit about the titles. The reason I chose non-conventional titles is because I think the businesses I made is not conventional also. And I think of myself as not conventional. I don't want to just fall into the traditional patterns or expectations people have of businesses. And so going back to honest tea, the most important thing was let's make sure the tea is great. And so calling myself the TEO said, that's, that's my focus. And if we make great tea, a lot of other things will happen. And even here at Eat the Change, let's make sure we're making change happen. We're not here just to be on a treadmill. We're not here just to sell more stuff to people. We're here to change to take their diets in a different direction to help them move from where they are and where we are right now especially with our food system we have the most developed food system in the history of the world you know there never people have never been able to have so much access to so many different nutritional things in such a convenient way and yet we have really the least healthy population in american history it's not just due to the pandemic but our life expectancy in the united states is lower than it's ever been relative to the rest of the world. We're ranked, uh, it, despite our wealth, which is enormous, and our knowledge, which is enormous, we're ranked around 40th in terms of average life expectancy against the rest of the world. Wow, I, I had no idea it was that low. So you'd, here then you say, that just can't be. How, what a, with all the resources, all the wealth, and it's due to, obviously, a lot of factors. There's stress, there's exercise or lack of exercise, but our food system is what we are, right? It's what we eat is what we become. And so we have a tremendous opportunity to change that. And so obviously the work I've been focused on is how do we shift people? Part of it is shifting what people choose. So how do you shift people's diets? But part of it is shifting what is offered to that, to us. Um, it's hard to blame people for having unhealthy diets if the only thing available to them is not healthy. But of course you go to a store, there are healthy products, but they're, they're not as popular as the the less health problems are not as affordable or they're not as well packaged. So it really is about trying to direct people's, the whole food system in a different direction. So that's the kind of change I'm focused on. And why lead? So let me quantify that question a little bit because too often it's very easy to sit back and say, someone else will do it. Yeah. It's a lot of work. It's hard. Yeah. People yeah. might not like me. They yeah. might not agree. <laughs> And we have what are what we call limiting beliefs. Yeah. And these limiting beliefs that someone else will do it. We just can't, you know, yeah. there's other things I can focus on. So what in you says, if I don't do it, no one else will, or someone else isn't going to do it this way. Well, it's funny. So we had our company eat the change every Monday. We just start the day with an open question. Since we don't get to have the kind of water cooler conversations we, you know, would have when everyone is in the office, we start that our Monday call with just everyone being able to share something. And so the question for Monday was, what is a, your theme song? So really there's not a wrong answer, except I apologized after I said it, but when our MBA intern talked about how she loves the song, Waiting for the World to Change by John Mayer. And I said, I love the tune. I hate the message. You can't wait for the world to change. You've got to be changing it. And so I hope I said it politely. I didn't, I certainly didn't want to make her feel a better choice. <laughs> if she still works there today, then I think you're okay. <laughs> yeah. But this idea, you know, we are the ones who are going to make this happen. There's no big government actor or, or third party that's going to make change happen. Like we are the ones entrusted and empowered to make change happen. There's no one else we should be waiting for. And so it starts with obviously our daily choices, our personal choices, but Everything we do, and of, of course, the, the amazing thing about food, I, I didn't even get into this when you asked about why change. I focus on health when we talked about changing our food system, but the other reason we need to change our food system is because it is the single biggest daily interaction we have with our planet. And so when we look at global warming, it is driving tremendous impact. You know, when we're wasting roughly a third of all the food grown doesn't make it to people. So that's a tremendous waste of resources of water, energy uh, used. 
when a fifth of global greenhouse gases come from the animal livestock industry. There's a huge impact on greenhouse gases and, and on global warming. So we have to recognize that. And, and literally every time we eat a meal, we have the chance to make an impact. And we do have an impact, whatever we choose. Can we take that impact to make it consistent with the, our hopes for the world and, and for a better future? Ultimately, this phrase, eat the change, is a call to action. It's a call to empowerment, but it's also a call to accountability. Without sort of trying to create a guilt trip for people, we want to make sure everyone understands that we're all responsible for what happens here. Yeah, we, we all have a part in it. We can't Absolutely. sit back and say that we're not impacting the environment, impacting society in any way. That's it. Elite performance, change, impact, success in anything, start, it starts with drive, what we define as drive, a need for an achievement, a growth mindset, be better tomorrow than we are today. We always say success is earned. You said, quote, I reject the notion that we were lucky to be in the right place at the right time. It mm. took us 10 years of hard work to end up in the right place at the right time. Mm -hmm. 10 years in which several competitors with better access to resources arose and crashed. This was not an overnight success story. And now this is in reference to the building of honest tea. You've been called an eternal optimist, a risk taker, <laughs> an all in kind of guy. Your co-founder said, Quote, fueled by his sense of purpose, Seth has amazing stamina. That's key in a startup, which is more like a marathon than a sprint, unquote. What is it about drive that is so critical to mm. entrepreneurs, to leaders in general? And how do you then tie in this optimism, this risk-taking and the criticality of having to be all in? Because the reality is, is you took a company from an idea to a hundred million units per year. It took 21 years. <laughs> and that's a long grind that you sustained. But how do you do that? How do you just wake up every day and say, I got to keep going? Yeah. Well, let's keep in mind, really, for all entrepreneurs, by definition, we have to be optimists. You know, you wouldn't start something if you didn't hope it was going to have hope to, for it to work out. The other thing to recognize that our competitive advantage has to be our tribe because the big companies have more resources. They have more information. They have more money. And so really the, the thing that differentiates us as entrepreneurs is an idea. We can think differently and we can act and, and not give up in a way that a big company won't. And I saw that, you know, as we started to work on this tea, got bought by Coca-Cola and I started to see when new venture ideas emerged at Coke, they just weren't as committed to the success. I mean, what I had on this tea, I had my, not just my living, you know, my, my paycheck on the line. I had bet the house. I basically had bet everything against that I was signing letters of loan guarantees for the business that were far in excess of my net worth. So the only thing that way was going to fail is I'd be carried out on a board. <laughs> there's extra motivation in there. There is, but there's also this belief, you know, going back to our earlier discussion around change, like this is an urgent cause, both around diet and around planet. Like it is, we as a species cannot continue the way we are living. There's a great Chinese proverb that if we don't change the direction we are headed, we will end up where we are going. And mm -hmm. all of those trends are just not where we want to go. We, we can't afford to go. Our planet can't afford to go. And so I had actually been a government major in college. I thought I was going to get to politics as a, as a form of change. And for me, what's been so rewarding about this career in business is this is a very impactful and enduring way to change behavior. And so I do look at this as a cause. And, and you know, at this point, money was never the motivating factor for me. It's nice that it's, you know, both Honesty and Beyond Me have worked out. Eat the chain, we're still in the middle of it, so it's too early to say. But if money were the, the thing, I would have stopped. I would have lost that drive. But it would, never was the, the driver. It's about getting to that place. Or, and, and we're never going to get there. As a, I mean, there's always more to do. But feeling that urgency is a great way to fuel the drive. Well, no matter how much drive you have, things aren't always going to go perfectly. That's There's for sure. There's this need for, right? Yeah. <laughs> Sometimes things may not go perfectly for days on it, weeks. So there's this element of resiliency, adaptability, two other core characteristics that are essential for an entrepreneur at any level in an organization. And I think it's important to quantify that in this conversation we've had in, in specifically in almost, I think in episode one, where we talked about entrepreneurs exist at every level in organizations. And if you build an organization that encourages innovation and growth and bottom-up input, you will have people who will drive the organization forward, even from the bottom up. And so we want to make sure that we 
think about these terms in this conversation that it's not always just about the top down. It right. can be from anywhere in the organization. But resiliency, we define as perseverance in the face of challenges, adaptability. We say we adjust one's behavior to the situation, change when things aren't working, find solutions to complex challenges without throwing your hands up and claiming it's not possible, it's too hard, it can't be done. You've referenced the three P's of entrepreneurship, passion, persistence, perseverance. I would call them you know, drive, resiliency, and adaptability. Two of your biggest challenges were distribution and operating capital. Mm -hmm. Two challenges that you were able to navigate due to what you called lessons learned as a Red Sox fan in the 70s and 80s. And now this, we have to dig in here because I'm happy you, <laughs> you were at Harvard and I was across the river at BU. So we have this connection and this affinity for the Red Sox there in at Fenway. If you don't know, in episode three, we actually had on former Red Sox second baseman from that era and Red Sox Hall of Famer, the president of Red Sox Nation, Jerry Remy. Oh, wow. And Jerry came on and he talked about the lessons learned from the Red Sox that have are applied to people's lives in whatever they do. And a big part of that was this resiliency and this yeah. adaptability and having to grind it out, having to figure it out, especially in those, what you said for formative years, he recalled them in very much the same way of the seventies and the eighties when there just was like, oh, another day, like what, you know, and he talked about it one year, they won almost a hundred games and they were deemed failures because they didn't go to the playoffs. They had lost a, a one game playoff to the Yankees. But I remember and it was that. Like, Guys, we... Like we, we won like a hundred games. Like what, what do you want? And everyone's like, nah, you're terrible. You suck, you know, get out of here. But you credit these three lessons primarily to the fandom of the Sox. What you call <laughs> manufacturing runs. There's always April and you got to win in New York. And I'm hoping that you might be able to like break these down a sure. little bit. Talk about how the Red Sox and, and this need to have to just kind of figure it out, get back at it, reverse the curse right. uh, and what it, what it can do for you and what it did do for you in the, in the building of the business. So let me clarify, it, it absolutely played a role. There were others as well. And I'm sure we'll talk about those too, but especially as a young fan, and I think everyone can probably relate to this, you get identified with the, all your heroes. And so you want your heroes to succeed. And, and I, it just so happened that I had the exact same birth date as Carl Yastrzemski. So, you know, who was the heart of the club in the 70s. Mm -hmm. And so I just felt like he was my guy. But and, and they would, they would get into these heartbreaking losses. And of course, for me, I was 10 years old in 1975, which was the, you know, the year they did go all, to, all the way to the World Series. And, and, and lost in a heartbreaking way. And when they lose, it's painful. But then, you know, you get back every spring and like, oh, maybe this is the year. And so it's this renewal of hope. And that is a, a really important and useful skill. And of course, an entrepreneur, you have to renew that oh, basically overnight. You could go to bed, just crush. Oh my gosh, you know, things were not able to make the product or we got some issue. Wake up in the morning and you got to be able to renew that hope. And I've always said the most important resource a, an entrepreneur has isn't time. It's actually the energy the entrepreneur has, what kind of energy. And so hopeful energy and positivity is something you can infuse into your team. Or conversely, negative energy is something you can also infuse into your team. And so it's really critical to be able to regenerate that hope. And so for me, the Red Sox are such a fun organization because they're, they're, they're it's such a diverse group of people in terms of who are the fans and so closely connected to the city. And it was and a lot of characters like Jerry Remy and, and, and yeah, as Carl Yastrzemski. And so you really, it's an easy team to get closely associated with. And they, they were never the, we always felt, they always had that underdog mindset. You know, it, you're in a, a market where the Yankees felt like, to put it in beverage terms, the Yankees were the big beverage companies mm -hmm. and the Red Sox were the challenger brand. And could they ever succeed? And, and I just identify with that mindset of the challenger. I, even with Honest Tea, when we'd been bought by Coca-Cola, I still had that challenger mindset. I think that's just critical because even though our brand now had resources, we still were challenging the prevailing dietary preference around beverages, which was for more sweet drinks. So I was literally part of the Coca-Cola company with the challenger mindset. And it just continues to be 
the way I look at the world. And, and I think that's just a very important mindset to have for entrepreneurs or, or for baseball teams or fans. I mean, specifically too, in manufacturing, I think was just a really interesting way you approach solving the manufacturing yeah. and, and some of the distribution problem too, where people just said, you know, we're not going to take you. And oh, you're like, okay, yeah. fine. I don't need the big guys. <laughs> well, the distribution was the classic. So, you know, of course I tried going to the big guys and say, Hey, can you distribute this product? We think we have some potential here. And like any large company, they're just going to say, there's not enough volume to make this worthwhile for us. And so I started from first, I was making the deliveries myself, which for a few weeks worked and I got some nice accounts up and running, but I couldn't keep up with it. And it certainly wasn't the way to grow the business. Cause every time I was driving my Saturn station or ragging around making deliveries meant I wasn't focused on selling in a chain or worrying about production or, or the capital to grow the business. So I quickly started to identify alternative routes to market for our business. And the first one we worked with was a cheese distributor who was going to gourmet stores. I'm like, well, you want to gourmet stores? He could take us along. And then I found that I wanted to get into the delis and I found a corned beef distributor who was going there. And I said, well, you can take us, you know, on your trucks. And then even to get to the grocery stores, I could, I was trying to figure out how do we get there? It turns out there was a guy who distributed charcoal. That he would, was happy to put us on his truck as well. So we basically put a patchwork of distribution together. And eventually these big companies started to see our brand taking some shelf space from them. And that's where they, I would say they returned my calls, but I, that's when I started to at least, you know, let me be in the lobby and wait till the CEO would walk in and I could just give him a, a bottle and, and a little bit of a pitch. So, you know, you've got to find a way to achieve your outcome. And if you only, if I had only said, I've got to get it with a big distributor. You know, the business would never would have gotten off the ground. Well, let's talk about money or in your case, as you were really as lack of money, because this is another area where you had to show tremendous adaptability and you experience things, your know, customers aren't paying, right? I, I think about this in like our own business, you know, you, you run a cash flow model and you think, okay, well, I'm going to send the invoice and they're going to pay me right away. And then I'm going to have operating capital, the cash flow, everything else. And then all of a sudden that invoice doesn't get paid. And you're like, well, oh, what do you mean he didn't pay me? And they're like, yeah. well, hey, look, I don't have it. But you had to deal with this. You had to deal with inventory builds, investment in marketing. You know, can there be an investment in marketing? I always tell companies what, you know, what happens. And I, you know, from my time in security, you notice what happens is when money gets constrained, the first two things that go out the window, security and marketing, mm. they're like gone, cut. But you had, a, you said, quote, limited resources forced us to find creative ways to achieve our goals. You need to raise enough money so that you don't run out of cash, but not so much that you feel flush. Too much money will make you stupid, unquote. What's the sweet spot when it comes to money? And how do you maintain yeah. a fiscal discipline when you know, there is a constant pressure to have to have more money because people will start to think, well, if I have more money, all my problems will be solved. Well, once again, I go back to that challenger mentality. It was interesting because all this tea started in 1998. And if you, if you look, think about what was happening, 1998, 99, 2000, it was this whole dot-com boom. So I had classmates of mine from Yale School of Management who were raising millions of dollars to launch their dot-com ideas. And I was trying to raise $25,000 at a time from angel investors for a beverage business that you know, just seemed very old school to them. I never had, was burdened by having too much money around. <laughs> and then as you, as you know, you know, it wasn't just there, there were some distributors who just did pay us for our, you know, basically cheated us. But then there were other distributors who, and I see this even now here with Eat the Change as we launched the new business. I, last week, or last month, I was expecting a check for $34,000 from the distributor. And by the time we got all the different chargebacks for this slotting and this promotion, I literally got a check for $93. And I'm like, oh. what? <laughs> well, that wasn't what I was expecting. So you've got to find. So then you got to find different ways to still achieve your goals. One of the things we did at Honest Tea very well is we developed great relationships with our suppliers. And of course, beverages are, are seasonal. So what I mean by that is I'm not selling a lot of iced tea in, in January, but I'll sell a lot in April and May. And I would go meet with our bottle supplier. He was our largest vendor. And I would drive up to King of Prussia, Pennsylvania, and I'd sit down with them and I'd say, okay, you, you know, the way our business works, we've got to build inventory to be available in, in April. But I, I, my cash gets tight as I look at February and March. So let's extend the terms and it, give me, rather than having me pay you in 30 days, can I pay you in 60 or even 90 days for some months? And then we'll get back up to speed and on good terms by the time we get to July. 
And so every year he agreed and every year it, we got to good terms by July. And so it was an annual thing, literally, you know, for more than 10 years, we worked on that basis, but it allowed me to achieve my goals. He grew his business and, and he was the one who had resources to help support it. So there are ways to still achieve your outcomes. And the one area that I was, I was always clear with our team is we're never going to out advertise our competition. Like we shouldn't be doing the conventional marketing. That's not going to be how we reach our consumer. And so that's an important mindset as well to just, you know, understand the terrain, understand your tools and use them as, as well as you can, but don't try to compete with somebody else's tools. Well, especially in marketing where if you mean you were going up against you were going up against the big ones, you know, Pepsi Coke. I right. mean, those marketing budgets for, for a single campaign of one product were at that time you know, larger than your gross revenues. I want to talk about humility, which we define as accurate self-awareness, introspection, ability to accept that we don't have all the answers and we we may need help. Because humility is often the first step to resiliency and adaptability because you can't be resilient, you can't be adaptive if you never can look inside and say, I'm not doing well, right? If you're just looking in the mirror going, I'm amazing. The numbers lie, right? (laughs) We always say the numbers don't lie. You know, you're lying to yourself if you think Mm -hmm. the numbers are lying. But many humble moments, they, they come on the back of failure and loss. And one of the biggest failures, both financially and in terms of time and effort, I think was probably this purchase of the production plant oh, yeah. and the decision to buy the plant came out of one of your earliest realizations and a core value, which I think is critically important was that it doesn't matter how good it is for you if it doesn't taste good. And so the theory kind of became, well, in order for it to always taste good, then we have to control production. If we control production, we control quality. But then there were all these other things that happen in your contamination, glass in the bottle that then make you look inside and go, do we really want to be a man, a run a manufacturing plant? So can you talk a little bit about why did you feel at that time it was so important to control production? Why did it become such a challenge so quickly? And when does an entrepreneur take a step back and have to say, hey, we got to cut our losses and we got to figure something else out? Yeah. So it's an important strategic question entrepreneurs face. So, so the first, in addition to assuring quality, we also wanted to assure supply. We initially set up production at an apple juice packing plant when we were trying to figure out how to make our first batches of tea. And we would use these big bags of kind of like mesh bags you might use to clean up a, a pool or oil spill. We would put tea leaves in them and dunk them in water at this apple plant. And they were humoring us for over the, you know, sort of early <laughs> spring when we launched. And through the early summer, when we got to the fall and they said, okay, now it's apple juice season. We can make more money packing apple juice than we can with your tea. So we're going to cut your production days way down. And I'm like, well, I did the math. I said, wait a minute, we're not going to be able to be sell more than a few hundred thousand dollars of tea with these guys if, if that's how it's going to work. And so what could put us out of business is not having any product. So we decided to become part owners of a bottling plant. And it was a, in retrospect, a the wrong decision because in addition to all the headaches you, you outlined, it also meant I was putting in a ton of energy into running a bottling plant. And what I ultimately realized I'm much better at and went on this team was where it became more valuable is to build a brand, to build a team with a culture and a passion that connects with consumers. And so instead of, you know, me driving, it was in, it just outside of Pittsburgh, me spending eight hours on the road, you know, every few weeks driving to there and back to Pittsburgh. And worrying all about cash flow and change parts and labor shifts at a bottling plant, I really should have been focused on building a brand, connecting with consumers, innovating. And it was only after we made that step away from the bottling plant that I was able to do those things. The brand started to realize its potential. It's a very common mistake. Entrepreneurs will think they need, and we ended up losing, as a business, we lost you know over a million dollars on that plant. So in retrospect, what we really should have done was go back to that apple juice plant and say, okay, well, look, I know you guys can make more money packing apple juice, but let us pay 50 cents more a case mm-hmm. to stay at the apple juice plant. And all of a sudden, maybe that would have cost us, let's say that cost us $100,000 more a year. It was still you know, better than losing you know a million dollars over time. Right. So that is often a mistake that the entrepreneur is making it. So the, ultimately it was a recognition of what was the value we were building. 
by the time we were with Coca-Cola, they didn't even want, you know, they had much better production facilities. They're like, we don't need that. Get rid of that. Right. <laughs> we want a valuable brand. And so you have to think about what are you building that's ultimately going to be really valuable. And then for the entrepreneur, what are you really passionate about it? And, you know, I, while I did a respectable job managing the bottling plant or doing my part to help manage it, it was not my wheelhouse. It wasn't my passion. So it wasn't feeding me. And going back to what I said earlier about how the energy of the entrepreneur is the key asset of the enterprise, I was literally sucking the energy out of me and out of my passion for the business. Every time I would be driving to Pittsburgh and worrying about things that had nothing to do with building a powerful brand. Shelly Paxton was on a couple episodes and she talked about soul sucks and soul fuels. And mm. Shelly was the CMO of Harley Davidson. And then she left. She just walked out and said, I'm going to go. I'm going to be, she's the chief soul officer. And she became the chief soul officer of her own life, wrote a book called Soul Badical. And we did it in the episode. She said, you have to define your soul sucks and your soul fuels. <laughs> and if you can eliminate those soul sucks yeah. in favor of the soul fuels, then whether it's in your personal life, your professional life, it allows you to then channel that energy on the things that have become more impactful. And so I think about this and I think of that. That was your For soul sure. suck. Big right? time. That integrity and curiosity. You said, quote, you have to build something you believe in right from the start, unquote. We define integrity as quality of being honest, having strong moral principles. I personally believe that we're most impactful when we're acting and serving in good faith and with honesty because it's easy. It's easy to devote energy when you're being honest and truthful. It's harder mm. when you're trying to deceive someone. You also said, quote, think ahead about what you want to accomplish, unquote. We define curiosity as the desire to learn or the desire to know something. Personally, I believe visionaries, transformative leaders challenge the status quo. They seek answers to these questions that a lot of people don't even realize that they may have. They develop products that people don't even realize they want or need. Think about Apple and the iPhone and the ear pods, the things that we can't live without. Beyond Meat comes to mind. The things that you're doing with Eat the Change and, and Planet Burger in a sense of like, you know, did, people didn't even know they want these things and now they can't get enough of them. <laughs> right. Honest Tea's mission was to create and promote great tasting, healthy, organic beverages. And you said, quote, we strive to grow our business with the same honest and in honesty and integrity we use to craft our recipes with sustainability and the great taste for all. Eat the Changes mission. Our choices about what we eat represent our single biggest daily opportunity to change our environmental footprint. Eat the Change combines marketplace solutions with education and activism to empower consumers to make dietary choices aligned with their concerns around climate and health. And then Planet Burger. We strive to respect and celebrate the beauty of life on our planet and the the most delicious and fun way possible with indulgent crafted plant-based burgers and an uplifting dining experience, we invite you to eat the change you wish to see in the world. Nothing is more forward-looking or honest or has this curiosity than that. Because I think about these three mission statements that have defined so much of what you've done. And I say, this is honest. This is honest. This is integrity. This is curiosity to want to do more. I'm wondering what you learned in the development of Honest Tea that you are now applying today mm. at Planet Burger and Eat the Change because it would have been so easy to put high fructose corn syrup, increase sugar, forget the plant-based food, put something processed in there and worry about cost, margin, ease of production, scalability, but you have always stood up for fair trade, community, integrity, and curiosity. Yeah. So for me, I honestly initially started as an idea, which was, could we achieve these goals around health, and around environment and around economic opportunity as a business? And the answer was, yes, we could. The way you, the, the key to it was we had to be able to build a brand that was meaningful. And when we did that, consumers embraced it, then we could help provide lower calorie drinks that did help remove billions of calories from the American diet. And that we could help shift the way tea is grown to more emphasis on organics, meaning avoiding the reliance on chemical pesticides, fertilizers, and artificial ingredients. And then by buying beef fair trade, we were able to bring economic opportunity to communities that didn't have access to it. So all of those 
things are achieved when we just sell a bottle of tea. And then what attracted me to Beyond Meat was this idea that if we can successfully commercialize a plant-based protein so that it tastes, it replicates the texture of meat, but made with plants, we have the ability to impact people's health because there's less cholesterol and other externalities associated with animal-based meat. We can help move what happens in the environment because a fifth of gluten, as I mentioned, greenhouse gases come from the livestock industry. And then we can also affect the constraint on resources where the Beyond Burger can be grown with 99% less land and 93% less water compared to an animal-based product. So the idea is, can you be, can a business be a, a vehicle for change, a vehicle for an activist to pursue agendas? And, and for me, my background actually before I went into business school was in the nonprofit sector. So I was quite comfortable thinking about making change happen either a nonprofit or as I mentioned in politics. So I learned with honesty, it can be done. The key is you have to still make sure you're providing a solution for the consumer. So just because I care about these issues doesn't mean the consumer cares about it. When a consumer goes to the store, they don't say, oh, I'm hungry. Maybe I'll go find something that can save the planet. They're like, <laughs> I'm hungry. I want something savory or delicious, or that's going to give me some energy. So that's what we've got to make sure we're communicating. And, and so I'm very fortunate with Eat the Change that my co-founder is Chef Spike Mendelson, who's a wonderfully creative chef. And we didn't just sort of make a plant-based jerky. We took mushrooms, which are for a chef kind of the ideal palate because they can really take on any flavor. And let's, I said to Spike, make the most delicious mushroom jerky you can make. You know, use any ingredient you want, and then we'll figure out how to make it sustainable. We'll and that's what he did. So he, he came up with these amazing recipes. And then I said, okay, well, this tastes great. So let's say, for example, he made a teriyaki ginger a mushroom jerky. I said, now what we've learned is that it has to be organic because that's part of our environmental commitment. We also learned that, you know, if we want to address food waste, we've got to be able to use all different shapes and sizes of mushrooms. Of course, that doesn't impact, you know, what he's doing at all because he, for him, it's the mushrooms are take on the flavor, whether they're small or big or misshapen. That's not an issue. But I also said, well, it turns out there are six crops that are responsible for 57% of all agricultural production. And if we're serious about biodiversity, we're going to leave all those crops out of the recipe. He's like, oh, okay. Well, that means no soy, no wheat, no corn, potatoes, sugar, uh, cane, or rice. And all of a sudden, well, that's in a lot of the foods we eat. <laughs> What's left? <laughs> exactly. So, well, it turns out you know, that's like a chef's challenge. He was, he was, right. Spike was a contestant on Top Chef. He's like, all right, well, that's just fine. So he was able to work with it. But the point is we ended up with recipes that were delicious, well-breaded, well-packaged. And as long as you do that, the consumer, whether they share our agenda or not, is going to have their needs met. And if we're meeting the consumer's needs, then we get to pursue the issues we care about. And it of course, it's nice that the consumer supports us and agrees with those issues, but it really doesn't matter at the end of the day. The mushroom jerky is, for lack of a better term, really cool. Thank you. It's fun. <laughs> it looks really fun. I've ordered some, but you have sea salt, sea salt and cracked pepper, yeah. hickory smokehouse, maple mustard, teriyaki ginger, and habanero barbecue. Yeah, that's a spicy one. And then the size of some of these mushrooms are absolutely massive. Well, that's so fun. Spike, you know, like I said, he just was, is so creative with the recipes. And so not just putting in like a chipotle, but like, let's go with habanero. That's where the you know, our real heat comes from. And, and then we partner with a fourth generation family farm in Pennsylvania that grows the mushrooms. And when we visited, we saw all types of, they're sort of the, the bend of the mushrooms that goes to the retail stores. And then there's kind of the rejects and I'm like, well, what's going on with those? Well, you know, the stores don't want to carry those mushrooms because they just don't look good enough to be on a shelf. I said, well, what happened? You know, we can take those for jerky because by the time you've infused it in a marinade and put it through a wood smoker, people can't tell if it was big or small, you know, and, and chopped it a little bit. So those mushrooms, which would normally not go to the retail shelf, are perfect for jerky as well as the stems because those also taste great, but aren't sold at retail. And for us, those are what we call perfectly imperfect mushrooms. And that's a great way of us addressing food waste, but also lowering our cost of goods. And to the consumer, it's all, you know, tastes great. This episode is brought to you by Analytics. Whatever industry you're in, 
Analytics has a group of experts with experience bringing efficiency, transparency, and analysis to your business performance. This includes franchises, restaurants, hotels and hospitality, professional services, e-commerce, startups, and retail. People in collaboration are two of the most important factors in running a successful company. Whether it's private label service, collaboration, or direct engagement with your customers, analytics can be involved in your client relationships, or they can complete all that other stuff and let you take the credit for it. Visit analytics.com for more information. That's A-N-A-L-Y-T-I-X dot com. You brought up your partner in this Spike Mendelson, and I want to use that to transition into team ability because he's mm. not the first partner that you've had first co-founder in fact co is all over everything that you've been a part of mm -hmm. that's hard in the military we said you can't have two people in charge or mm. if we're all in charge then no one is in charge mm -hmm. but there's tremendous value in this title co especially when it's a partnership and there's a complementary partnership. At Honest, your partner said, Seth's personality makes him a great match for me as a business partner. Our skill sets complement one another. Barry was the conceptualizer. He was logical, analytical, fact-based, organized, practical, outgoing. He was the coordinator of sorts. And you were what he called the protector, dutiful, meticulous, supportive, optimistic, enthusiastic, values-driven, and you were the constant enthusiast driving everyone forward. But Barry also said, you spend a lot of time with a business partner, so you should enjoy being with that person. And that's, he said, Seth helps me become a better person, in his words. Very nice. <laughs> Can you talk about these partnerships? Like, how do you assess a partner? Because in both of these situations, this was you going and saying, I have this idea. I need someone, you know, you pushed the Beyond Meat Burger under Spike and said, hey, try this thing. And initially yeah. he was like, I don't know, but then got on board, you know, same with Barry. So how do you assess partnership and how do you look at someone and say, this is somebody that I want to work with because so many of these business relationships, I mean, it's sometimes worse than a marriage. Well, first let's start, we'll go back to what we talked about around humility. And that's a critical quality. And part of humility is a recognition that you don't have all the answers or you can't do it all on your own. Or there are other people who can do certain things better than you. And so humility is an important quality. And I think humility is not just in part important in terms of getting co-founders, but in terms of an organization, unless you have humility, you're not really going to empower your team to take action. So it takes humility to empower others. And for me, going back to honesty, I've never run a business before. And Barry, both because he was a professor and he'd been on corporate boards and it just had more experience, was somebody who had a lot more knowledge about a business. And he was as had been my professor, so wonderfully creative and divergent thinker. And so there's a phrase, if two people are thinking the same thing all the time, one of them's not thinking. And so we needed the diversity of thought to understand, to find the right approach. And then when there were things neither of us knew, we could work through an issue and decide it together. At the I believe co-founders are great. What often is missing, and it hasn't been, it been missing in the, my enterprises, is clarity of roles. So as long as there's clarity of roles, then co-founders can be great. If it's fuzzy or if you have a co-CEO arrangement, which I don't believe it, then you do, as you said, no one is, is in charge. With Eat the Change, I already knew as I was building this brand, I had <clears throat> the name, which I loved, but that's not a name that drives taste. And then you've heard me talk all about our environmental commitments. Those are, are very important to me and, and to what the brand represents. But once again, those aren't about taste. So I needed somebody who could make sure we had taste addressed as a credential for the brand. And so working with Spike, who I had already known from our work at Planet Burger, I knew he could deliver a delicious product. And he himself is creative, not just with, in the kitchen, but even in social media. And so... He, we have a perfect balance there. Now, yes, I'm the CEO of the business or the chief change agent, but we both understand that. And, and it, of course, I consult him on any important strategic decision, but I don't pretend to tell him what to do in the kitchen and he doesn't pretend to tell me our cash flow, you know, should be adjusted or, or something like that. So, and so as long as we have clarity of roles, then we can be complimentary with each other. I want to ask you about personal relationships. You've made that a big part of it. And, and it dovetails after the you know conversation about these partnerships and having to develop these close partnerships, because 
trust comes into play. It's a huge part of this. But you spent a lot of time and still do developing very deep personal relationships. You talked about it with your fair trade partners, your suppliers, your distributors. You also spoke about it with your team and how you develop your team and develop the organization. You said, quote, the unheralded moments were what made the difference in our success. And those extra efforts represent the kind of behavior you can't buy, but they are the result of dedicated people inspired and united by a common mission and goal. I think this is really important because you can't bring people together to a common mm. mission and goal if there's no trust. If you don't know what each other are after, you don't understand their roles, clarity behind that, you don't build that common bond, you'll never get there. So can you talk about building an organization that's based on the importance of people, the relationship between them and the trust factor? Yeah, it is critical. And it really goes back to what I was saying around empowerment. You can't motivate people unless, if you just tell people what to do the whole time, then they, then they feel like they're order takers. They're not entrepreneurs in their own right. But if you help them identify a goal, and help them identify how to get there and provide them the resources to get there. But then step out of the way. That's the best way to create trust there is. Because then they say, wow, this person really believes in me, believes I can do it. And that is a very empowering opportunity for an individual. And of course, you have to make sure you're giving them the right guidance along the way and hold them accountable. But that is, for me, how you create trust with people. And I think it's also important to recognize the roles and respect that I, I, for me, the most important relationship I have in the world is the one I have with my wife, because she's my co-founder in our family and in our relationship. And I've always got to make sure that I don't take that for granted or that it's very easy when you're the leader of a company to say, oh, well, I'm a leader of the company. I'm a leader of a family. And you're not. You Maybe are, not. <laughs> you're a co-founder. <laughs> you should have a say. But every once in a while, it's funny because we'll be sort of cooking a meal together and she'll say, okay, we'll cut up the onion and, I, and I'll start doing it. And then, then she'll step in and say, no, you got to do it this way. I said, I say, you are, you're not empowering me. You've got to, <laughs> you've got to, you have to respect, you've got to give me, give me the knife, give me the onion, give me the cutting board, tell me what to do and then let me do it. Don't, right. if you, it's a little bit of, I'm teasing her a bit, but I think in every relationship you have to, you do need clarity of roles, but you also need to have trust and ultimately to demonstrate trust is to give people the, the empower, the power to, to act on what they care about. So there's another, the other side of trust though. Yeah, I think we need to explore for a moment because you have put a lot of focus on building the team, empowering others, but also one of your core tenets is don't delegate at the beginning. Yes. Yeah. And you've said, quote, the best way to get a handle on the business is to learn every aspect. You're not supposed to know what to do. But don't be afraid to try doing it all because you've done all this, right? You said, I have a conversation. I can have a conversation with any, ever, any employee, supplier, or customer about what they do, ask challenging questions, and not get snowballed, unquote. That takes an incredible amount of time and energy, especially if you're scaling a business. And there's a risk of being too involved, not delegating enough. There's so many examples of founders who've actually stifled growth, mm. stifled innovation. They won't get out of the way. They've been in the company eight, yeah. 10 years. And it's still, you ask someone a question and they say, oh, I've got to go to the founder and ask them if that's okay. And it's like, guys, this is like a simple question. You know, yeah. what do you want? What do you want for lunch? You don't have to ask the founder. <laughs> but maintaining this balance takes what we call emotional strength. And emotional strength, we define as emotional control in the stressful situation, bringing calm to chaos. Because when you're involved in all this, it creates stress. When you're not involved with all this, it creates stress. So you have to have this emotional strength to control your emotions and balance that. So what is the balance between making it happen yourself, getting out of the way, letting experts handle it? How do you know? I think it's about scale. So my comments about the entrepreneur doing everything really is important at the beginning of the business. When you're standing up the business, you do want to be exposed to all the details because by definition, if you're growing the business, eventually you won't be exposed to all those details, but you still have to understand how things work under the surface. And then as you grow, it does get more complex. You ideally hire people who know more and can do more, but you, you have enough knowledge of the dynamics of the structure of the business that you could still be, have relevant conversations. And so that's how I think about it at startup. And not every startup starts super small, but I like to do that. I, I like to start from scratch because that ensures I'm 
I'm in on the, you know, the ground floor of, of our learning right? because you learned so much in that first, those first few months. And so those learnings basically inform how the business grows going forward. The advice you give to new entrepreneurs is run away. <laughs> you spent 20 years building honesty. You sold it to Coca-Cola in a, a, a successful exit. You're chairman of the board at Beyond Me, another innovative, transformative company. But you have now jumped back into the startup world right. and launched Eat the Change. Let's discuss effective intelligence, which is the application of one's past experience and knowledge to the current situation. The cumulative information that we have lived, our experiences, is what then shapes our ability to make decisions and affect our future. Your lessons in the past have provided you a perspective on how to build a business and success and failure. We could sit here and make a very viable argument that you've made it. You don't need to go start over in something else. But why? Why jump back in? Why say, I spent a career doing this. Everything's pretty good in my life, but I'm going to jump back in and start again in something different. Well, for me, it goes back to that opening conversation we had around the change. Like if, if I felt, oh, well, we're on the right trajectory, if, if our agricultural system is getting better for the planet, if people's, if the health trends suggest people are shifting toward or more organic or more plant-based diets, then I'd say, oh, okay, we're good, but you know, it's quite the opposite. And so the work is not done. And I feel if nothing else, a responsibility to use what I've learned to help us move in that direction. But I'd also say I feel an opportunity, you know, just I do like growing things. And so I see where there's more opportunity to move people to certain categories where the options just aren't healthy or as sustainable as they could be. And can I play a role in shifting what we eat and how we eat it? Eat the Change is a combination of several initiatives. There's Planet Burger, which is rapidly scaling and opening new stores. You have Eat the Change Impact, which is a grant program with the goal of donating more than $1.25 million over the next three years to support diverse groups of nonprofit organizations. We spoke about the mushroom jerky. And then you have the Incredible Planet Challenge, which is these 21 challenges that allow you and show you that you can make simple changes, simple swaps in your everyday to then bring change to the world. Can you talk about these different initiatives and how each one of them is driving towards that goal that you just talked about? Yeah, you know, this, as I said, is a movement to shift people's diets. And, and so you really, any movement needs participants from all sectors. And so what we do with the grant program, we, we just uh, last week announced 36 organizations around the country, whether it's an urban farm in Los Angeles or a community, a Native American community that's trying to reconnect to some of their historical crops they used to live on. So these are different organizations working to shift people's toward healthier diets. So that's on the nonprofit side. And then the restaurant Planet Burger is a food service to make planet-based eating delicious and fun and uh, as accessible as any fast food restaurant. And so we are opening up our 10th restaurant later this month. And so that's a fun way for people to access that product or that really approach to eating. And they need the change is, you know, an on-the-go snack company. So the mushroom jerky is the first product, but these are all part of the same theme, all part of the same emphasis. And we hope consumers will embrace what we're doing, whether it's at a restaurant or maybe they'll be involved and exposed to one of the nonprofit organizations we're supporting, or of course, you know, be able to pick up a bag of jerky when they're hungry for a savory snack. Seth, as we close out, the Jedbergs, they had to do three things every day to win. Three foundational core skills. They had to shoot, they had to move, they had to communicate. If they did these three things every day and they did them with precision, it didn't matter what challenges came their way, they could divert their attention into solving those other challenges. What are the three things that you do every day mm -hmm. set the conditions to be successful? So the first is I wake up with my wife and we make the bed. It's not just important because it means at the end of the day, we'll have a, a, a welcoming place to, you know, lie down, but it, it's sort of our way of saying, you know, I'm your partner in the day, in your home and in your life. And so we're living together. That's one thing. The next one for me is I'll go out for an hour of some form of exercise. 
And it could be running, biking, swimming, usually the, the ones that most frequently doing. And for me, it's a great moment to clear my head, to get, put things in perspective, to, I always do it outside, even the coldest months. And it's a great way for me to also just connect with the earth. So this week I'm out in, in Los Angeles and so I'm able to run along the side of the water and the sand and, and the, just to feel the air around me. It helps sort of me keep my place in the world in perspective. So that's uh, an important thing. And then obviously get to work. And the one thing I always mindful of is follow up. So as a work discipline, I never commit to something I can't execute on. I never let somebody sort of reach out to me and not hear back. So for me, doing what you say and coming through sort of delivering on what you say is just a critical part of how I work. I want to be certainly regarded as someone who lives up to the word, you know, a commitment and being authentic about that. Make the bed every day, exercise, follow up, stand by your word, do what you say you're going to do. That's it. I love those three. So we spoke at length about the nine characteristics of elite performance. We told your story through the lens of these and provided those lessons learned and those valuable kind of ways in which we can become better every day if we can think about these characteristics and apply them into our everyday world, personally, professionally, emotionally, spiritually, mentally. We talk about the nine and I say that as an elite performer, you have to have all nine, but you can only demonstrate a certain number of them at any one time. And then I always go the opposite direction at the end of this. And I say, I'm going to give you one. And I'm going to tell you the one that you exemplify. And I will tell you that in transparency before this conversation, I would have said drive for you, but I actually have to change that. And I'm going to say integrity because integrity is doing what's right, identifying right from wrong. But integrity for you is, has been your driving factor. It's what has led you to create honesty. It's what has led you to be part of an innovation, an innovative company like Beyond Me, to then create Eat the Change because there is integrity behind doing what's right for people and for empowering people to become better versions of themselves for themselves, for their families, for society. And that comes down to a true understanding of what is right for all factors involved. Seth, you're an inspiration. You're an entrepreneur. It was amazing to sit here and speak with you. I'm a guy who has 35 new ideas a day and I always want to pursue them all. After hearing your story, speaking with you, reading your book, it has certainly forced me to think about maybe a couple that I should focus on and drive them to success because if there is this focus, you can get further. But we all have something to learn from you. I sincerely appreciate your time and I look forward to the future of Eat the Change and what you will continue to bring to the world. Thank you, Fran. I enjoyed the conversation and, and uh, certainly appreciate your kind words around integrity. That's a, a wonderful characteristic or trait to try to live up to. I'll <laughs> do my best. Thank you. American Jedbergs went on to form the foundation of the United States Special Forces and the Special Activities Directorate of the Central Intelligence Agency. Thanks for listening to the Jedberg Podcast. I'm your host, Fran Ruchopi. We're brought to you by the Talent War Group, an executive search firm and talent advisory. We'll drive you to attract, retain, and develop top talent. With services like talent acquisition, leadership development, and keynote speeches, we work with you to create talent solutions to business problems. To get started, visit talentwargroup.com. Join us next week for a new episode of the Jedberg Podcast on Spotify, Apple, Stitcher, and iHeartRadio, or wherever you get your podcasts. If you like what you heard, give us a like and leave a review. Follow me, Fran Ricciopi, the Talent War Group, and the Jedberg Podcast on LinkedIn, Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram. And send your comments and inquiries to media at talentwargroup.com. As former members of Special Operations Forces, the Jedberg Podcast and the Talent War Group contribute a percentage of all profits to the Special Operations Warrior Foundation, supporting the families of our fallen warriors. Thanks for joining us on this episode. How you prepare today determines success tomorrow.